I have some questions for you. Yes. I'd like to know. Okay, so, go ahead. And you, you, you have a degree in sociology, don't you? And, yes, I and do. What else have you done apart I from sociology? Have, um, I have a bachelor in international studies from a private Catholic university in Manhattan, uh -huh, Marymount right. Manhattan College, and then. Um, while I was uh, a student at Mary Ma Ma uh, Mary Mount? Mount Manhattan College, yeah, Mary Mount Manhattan College, we, I met uh, the, uh, a professor from Queens College. And uh, at the same time, I was trying to do an internship at the UN, at UNIFEM at that time. And they said that I needed to be enrolled into a graduate program. So he told me, I told him, at a celebration at Marymount Manhattan College. And he said, no, don't come to Queens College and I introduce you and then you can talk to people in sociology. And then I, I went there and then I got enrolled in sociology. So I was able to go to the UN for a few months. And then was I- this, Was this an internship at the UN? An internship, okay. but I also worked at the, in Africa at the UN at UNICEF as a consultant. Oh, okay. And I also worked for an international organization in France, in Paris. And then I went and did some other work with international organizations that I don't need to mention right here. And uh, when I came back from uh, working for the UN coming from Africa, I, um, I said, what am I going to do, you know, because now I've spent almost 10 years in Africa, I, although I have two masters and I came back to America, I'm lost and I got into the health field. And, uh, but my first love was writing, so. So what were, we, what were you doing in Africa? I mean, you say you work for the UN. I work for the UN. I work for two other international organizations. And I so what did you do? Um, uh, for the UN, I did um, approve um, proposals that they would submit proposals, those organizations or associations that were helping women or children, and then they would submit their proposals. So I would go to them and then recommend whether or not they should be approved. And I also help with people with uh, HIVs. Uh -huh. And I work for the University of Columbia. They had an organization called uh, the Earth Institute of Foundation. But that was, I was the malaria coordinator in, um, in Africa, in Central Africa. So what I did, I uh, sensibilized, you know, sensitized people about malaria as a uh, as a disease because most people when they get sick they don't go to the doctor they use their traditional medicine mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. i was to go there and make sure that they i distributed bed nets and make sure that they take their medication or they get tested i also had a friend who was uh, from hong kong and was working for taiwan in central africa and she was helping someone who had an organization with helping people with hiv so i used to go and make sure that they take their medication mm -hmm. and tell them that mm -hmm. they had to be tested and make sure and we had to give them incentives mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, otherwise it would be difficult for them to come it was a small country to say that hey you know they have hiv because they'll be segmentized and when I came back, I came back to my first love that was writing. So I, uh, before I went to Africa, I published two books. Uh, I mean, four actually, but two of mine. Um, How to Dance with Life. This is a book of essays that um, based upon my experiences. So I taught people, uh, be, um, tell them how to live life in order to to have uh, happy returns, you know, because in life uh, there are rules to be followed and then sometimes if you get out of tune, then your life become a mess. Mm -hmm. But as I grew older, I change. I'm writing another book that's titled You've Got to Boogie Boogie Until You Die <laughs> because I realize that it's not always about following the rules or doing the right thing, although you have to do the right thing. Uh, but also, life has some twists and turns. Sometimes you've got to boogie, you know, you have to adjust to life. It's not a linear 
you know, thing, you know, it's not a straight line. Sometimes you have to compromise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so where were you in, in Africa? Which countries? I, were I'm you in East Africa or West Africa? I was actually, I've, I've been to East Africa, Burundi, I've been to Uganda, I've been to uh, Sao Tome. Uh -huh. I was in Guinea-Bissau uh, for a little while. I've also visited the southern part of uh, Africa, that's Mozambique. Mm -hmm. And I've been to Gabon, and then Nigeria, which is West Africa, Benin. Benin, I lived yeah. there for a while. Yeah, that's where I did my research in Benin. And Togo yeah. also, yeah. and Accra. I mean, mm -hmm. I've not been to other part of Ghana, but no, no, I've been to Accra and the Gold Coast of mm -hmm. uh, uh, to the Elmina Castle. Yes. Right. So I've been all over Africa, but I work mostly in Central Africa yeah. and then West Africa. I cannot wait to go back yeah. because I don't know, I, there is something with me in Africa, you know. It's like my soul belongs to Africa when I'm there. I feel there is a co spiritual connection. Yeah, I, I, I know mean, how you feel because yes. I did my work, my uh -huh. research that I did in Benin. Yes. And I feel the same way about Benin as well. Yeah, the first time I went to, to Benin, I went to Ouida. Of course, yes. Yeah, La Porte de Nouveau, La Porte de Nouveau, of, uh, of Long Return. Return. Yeah. And I went and then I took my uh, shoes off and I got into the water. I felt like, it's like I was possessed, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, by the tell spirits us a little of bit, my Maybe senses. I tell the audience <laughs> what, the, what the port of no return is, the door of no return. <laughs> tell the audience what that is. I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, you probably know more about it than I do, but I think that's the door where the slaves, they, th where yes. the, they boarded the slaves to bring them to the new world. Right. So when the it was a sort of a way station. Yes. Before exactly. they could be put on a ship. Exactly. Yeah. So they got there, they put them on the boat, and they never returned. Right. So they called it the door of no, no return. No return. Yeah. Yeah. So when I got there, I was like, you know. Now, in that you saw this in Benin. In where, Benin. where would it have been in Benin? Uh, it's in Wida. In Wida. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there's also a very important temple there in Wida. The you? temple of Budo. Yes. Yeah, I've, I've visited. I mean, it has it has been a while. I don't yeah. remember the the name of the temple, but I visited everywhere in Benin yeah. and in Alada as well. Right. Because I was just like you, I'm from Haiti, so. Right. And when they had a statue of two Saint Louis, yes, here. that's right. Yeah. So they had a place people would sit and drink beers, and uh, so I used to sit there, and then I even took pictures, you know, under yeah. the statue of two Saint Louis, yeah. looking for some kind of connection or mm -hmm. guidance mm -hmm. whenever I was lost, you know, because I was by myself there. I'll go and say, okay, yeah. two Saint can guide me. But you know. you've you've done lots of other things. I mean, from what I know of you. You've also uh, done some work with the nonprofit world. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. After after I graduated and then I worked in Africa for a while, I came back and got into the health field, healthcare field. It's like it was not enough for me. My writing, sometimes, you know, with writer's block, I was looking for something exciting to do. And then I met a few friends and they told me about Yukon. Um, uh, the public policy and leadership, Greater Hartford, uh -huh, with uh -huh. uh, UConn, they had a program called Encore, and I decided to enroll uh, in the program. It is uh, transitioning from um, profit to the profit to the non-profit world. Uh -huh. So I, I graduated from UConn, for, and I became an Encore Fellow. And uh, right after I graduated, I was thinking, but prior to that, I had become uh, um, a producer at Nutmeg uh, TV oh, in yes, Farmington. Right. So I had my first book, How to Dance with Life. So I was thinking, maybe I'll do a show about how to dance with life. I'll tell people about life, about you know my experiences, so they can better their lives, so they don't repeat my mistakes. And uh, as I was driving, and I heard that song, you know, and then I, you know, I went to my graduation by myself because all my family, they are in New York and, and I was driving about myself and then something just hit me. Why, why don't you do a show about the nonprofit world? Because I had learned so much about big organizations merging with small organizations, like, and then firing all their employees 
And then also about, uh, I think, one organization during the earthquake in Haiti received about four billions and only built like four or five houses. And then the overhead just came back to the United States and the people, they were still living in tents. Yeah. So I needed to give visibilities to those small organizations who are doing, that are doing great work. And they are like the unsung heroes. Right. And then with big organizations, with big names, but not doing as much yeah. and getting all the money. So yeah. that was the, my show was to connect um, organizations with uh, service recipients. Right. Uh, to educate them and then to let them know that there were services mm -hmm. available. Mm -hmm. Because I remember one of my first interviews I did with uh, a lady from St. Agnes. Uh, that's an organization that help um, uh, pregnant teens, mm -hmm. you know, help them with their kids. Because if you're a teenager, you got pregnant and then you had nowhere to leave your kids. So that organization helped them. And then the mothers could go back to school and lead a uh, you know, productive life. And unfortunately, they closed. But I was very excited. That was one of the first organizations right. that I That's interviewed. very good. You know, the, the, the earthquake was in 2010, yes. January 2010. Yeah, I remember. I uh, and uh, I remember being in Haiti only about three months after that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a horrible, horrific uh, event that occurred. I mean, the earthquake lasted six seconds. Yes. And it killed over half a million people in six seconds. I know. I it know. was just absolutely incredible. I remember that. And what's going and on now in Haiti is horrible as well. It's worse than I, an earthquake. I, I, I don't know if you're following the news. Yeah, I have. Yes. But you know, in the past, in, in the three months after the earthquake, there were so many, there were so many rubbles everywhere from building that had collapsed mm -hmm. that as you went down the street, there was, you were looking at rubble, but you know that there were bodies under there. Yes. And I remember passing a, a school where there was something like a hundred children who were killed and were under this, uh, wow. uh, this rubble. But tell me, you've also done some extraordinary things that you're not telling us. Not I mean, what? you're working on a book on poems, and I have the poems right here. Yes. Uh, so tell us about, about the poems uh, that you're writing. I read, I read them. Which uh, one do you like? I mean, oh, I don't have like any. Spa I don't have any one that I. I like all of them. I think they're quite beautiful, they're very elegantly written. And I think the thing that strikes me about these poems is that you're really expressing something of your own, your own heart. Uh, yes. And, and there are some poems in there that are connected with some specific experiences yeah, exactly. that have inspired these poems. Tell us about that. <laughs> what are, are some I of those? Know. I mean, uh, this, I have, I've already published a book of poems called My Time. Right. So this yeah. one I'm working on, the title is Heartfelt. So it's just, I want to be honest about my life and uh, my feelings, and I don't want to hide anything. Right. Uh, as someone who does, I mean, I, does, I do not have kids. So I think um, my writings, they're like my legacy. So I want to, I mean, leave something behind, you know, to just let people know that I was here. Because, I mean, when you have kids, your kids will have kids, and then you leave, you know, a legacy. A legacy, yeah, yeah. sure. But me, these are me saying that I'm here, I was here, and this is what I've had, I, I have experienced as, as a woman, as, as a woman of color, as a human being. And these are my true feelings, and I want to share it. So. Yeah, I but I, I noticed that, uh, in, um, at least in one of the poems, that you talk about cutting off from a spiritual world. Um, tell, tell us about, about that. Why do you want to be cut off from the spiritual world? <laughs> This is a poem about energy that you wrote. That oh, no, it's not that I want to cut off from the spiritual world. I'm recalling my energy because throughout life you have people, they're like vampires. I mean, you scatter your energy to, un, you know, helping ungrateful people or, or people who do not appreciate you. Mm -hmm. So I, I was 
uh, one time I was at home and I was thinking about a particular family member who was very mean to me after everything that I had done to help, you know, that person in the past. And then it just occurred to me if I could just get all my energy back because, because of all the help that I give people, sometimes I feel drained out. Right, I mean, sure. I'm the type of person who, who went through life not knowing how to say no. You know, I will help, help even if it, you know, nearly destroy me. I, you know, I just cannot see people in pain. And, um, and I've sacrificed a good part of my life helping others. And I was, this poem was <laughs> an answer, you know, uh, to me sitting at home being peace. Being, <laughs> myself, being angry at myself. Uh -huh. So I said, look at my life, you know, what have I done? You know, I need my energy back, so I recall them. So that's, you know, and... <laughs> but despite your experiences, you've also written um, some poems here that deal with, uh, with hope. Yes, um, yes. So... I mean, it depends on my mood. I mean, as a writer, you know, I'm, I experience things fully. Sometimes uh, I, I'm hopeful and, you know, I believe in love, I believe in life and hope, but I also experience pains and despair and regret. So and sometimes I regret wasting my time on some people and I want my energy back. I wish I could get it back. <laughs> so that's what this poem is about. Yes, yes. Uh, it's it's like, about getting... Can you read it? Can you read part of yeah, it? Yeah, I call, I call upon my energy from all corners of the universe. Wherever it is felt to return, I call upon all pieces of myself, scattered through the laying of hands, supplications, incantations, out-of-body experiences, sexual encounters to return. I cut all invisible spiritual cords that no longer serve my journey. I command my spirit to no longer waste energy. Yeah, I, I, I think yes. that uh, yeah. uh, that's why I was asking you about, about energy, because that's... Yeah. Um, Which precisely. other one that you like? Because we have to go some. Uh, well, <laughs> let me see. Um, that late afternoon, defying all logic, I infused life into the nearly lifeless being. Through the laying of hands, shared some of my spiritual gifts with you, and our lives became cosmically entangled. I begged, bargained, I'm sorry, bargained, pleaded your case with God since that day. I walked around with a feeble life force. Today, what has gotten into you? This is the hands, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, this is the thanks I get. Exactly. So, so this is the type of energy. This is why I was calling my energy because I'm like a spiritual master. I'm um, like um, highly spiritual and I could, I don't know if I still have that gift, but I used to be able to lay my hands on someone sick and then that person will no longer be sick. I mean, I mean, with the help of God. And, uh, so. <laughs> but you also write a lot about being thankful. What are you thankful about? Because I noticed some of the poems also uh, talk about, uh, about being thanks. And you mentioned that word many, many times in your poems. I'm thankful uh, for my life. I'm thankful for what I've accomplished with everything that's going on in the world. And um, uh, people getting hurt. And uh, I was able to be here. I went to university and I have two masters and I have a, a good life even though it's not the life that I had wished for. So I'm thankful for my health. I'm thankful for God for uh, making me the person that I am today. And. Um, for having you as my mentor. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> for being here on the TV station doing the Sarah show. So I'm sure that uh, a lot of people would enjoy living my life, even yeah. though I'm striving for more. 
And you also write a lot about dreams, your dreams. What do you dream about? What are some of the things that you really I had a think dream. Uh, I was, uh, I ha my dreams, they are like guidelines for my life. Uh, a particular dream that I had, it's like I can go back to that dream and I know exactly where I'm at at that particular time in, uh, you know, of my life. So being very spiritual and being connected to the source. So my dreams are not really dreams, they're like messages. They're like guidances. So when I, I don't have dreams like other people have dreams because I believe that I'm one of the chosen. So what makes, what makes your dream so, so peculiar and so unique then? Because they do come true. Ah. Yes, it's, they're just messages. Or this is what you should do and don't go there, do this. Or, for example, what's happening in my life now, I've known it for a while. I knew it was going to happen, and I know that after it's over, I'm going to be okay. So it's like God telling me, you have to go through this. You know, it's like a rite of passage, mm -hmm. but you're going to be okay. So I have faith, even though at times it, uh, the pain is too much, the suffering, you know. But I know that at the end, if I believe in God and if I believe in His guidance and His words, that I'm going to be fine. Just yeah. have to hang in there. But one of the things I noticed about your poems is that you also have uh, some references quite a bit to, to Africa and your experiences in Africa. I mean, for example, you talk about the spirits of your ancestors, of ancestors in Africa, yes. who uh, seem to uh, guide you. In, but do you often dream of, of ancestors? Yes, I, I dream of my of the spirits, and they come to visit me sometimes. <laughs> and uh, yes, I'm well connected to the spirits of my ancestors, but that'll be another interview. <laughs> yeah, but that's very interesting because ancestors, uh, those who've passed on, mm -hmm. are very important in Africa. Yes, and they are revered, as a matter of fact. Yes, uh, and their names are remembered. Yes. Uh, through in, in, in the family. Yes. And they serve as models for young people as well because lots exactly. of stories mm -hmm. are told to young people about mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. and, and about the heroic things that they mm -hmm. ha might have done. Um, but, uh, but not only that, but also in Africa, dreams are also important exactly. as well. Exactly. So although, um, although I'm Caribbean American, it's like I'm an African because the spirits of my ancestors all my life, uh, they never left me, and that has been a battle for my soul mm -hmm. because I, I grew up Catholic, and uh, and I also have the spirits of my ancestors. So sometimes I don't know which way to go. I think I, I wrote a poem about that. Yes, that's um, what I was asking. It's right yes, here. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's it has been very challenging for me because. Uh, they always make you believe that the spirits of your ancestors, they are evil. And then, you know, the, and the other religions are better. So being raised as a Catholic and also being raised as in a family who were well, um, I mean, I, I don't know how to say that they knew, they had knowledge about the spiritual world, you know and has been really difficult, mm -hmm. uh, very mm -hmm. difficult for me to reconcile those two religions. Which I mean, it's religions? not a religion, it's like a way of life for us, you know, yes. at the spirits of the ancestors and everything. And then you have to go to church, Catholic church, and pray to Jesus and to God. And then also, you have to also acknowledge that the spirits, the saints are also the, the, the spirits. But there, do you see any contradictions between the two? I mean, is there a tension between that? Or no, no, no. Can you not, bring it, them together and hard, marriage the two? It's hard to reconcile. Oh, it's hard to reconcile. For me, yes, I mean. And, uh, but you mean you beat the reconciliation is between the belief and uh, the power of ancestors, the reverence of ancestors? No, because uh, in, um, as a Catholic, there's only one God. Right. And uh, when you believe in the spirits of your ancestors, it's like 
many gods. Well, yeah. You know, so how do you reconcile? I mean, you're supposed to pray to God, you know, if, although we have to talk about that another time because I've learned in, uh, in uh, the Caribbean, they serve the spirits, but in Africa, the spirits served us. Yes. So it's a different way of Correct. life. So uh, to me, all my life, I've been really struggling, you know, which way to go. You understand? Mm -hmm. Or if I believe in the spirits of my ancestors, am I doing something wrong? You know, am I being a bad person? Is God going to punish me? And you understand what I mean? Yeah. So it has been really difficult. So, but we we'll talk about it. But I mean, I can see this in, in uh, some of your poems. There's a poem here, particularly in, in the book Heartfelt, yes. uh, that does uh, talk about uh, precisely the uh, yeah. about ancestors. Yes. But I, I thought in Africa, though, uh, the spirits are not really gods. I mean, they're spirits. But in most of African religions only have one god, and Voodoo only has one god. Yeah. But there are but different... about the spirits? The spirits are personalities, oh, okay. different personalities. And that's why I call my book The Faces of the Gods, because I'm dealing with the different spirits. Mm -hmm. And the, the spirits are different facets of different faces. Faces of the gods or faces, faces of the gods? Faces of God. Of God. Faces okay. of God, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, there, is, uh, there is only one, one God, I think, in voodoo. Mm -hmm. And most religions in Africa uh, also is the same. And I think there's some comparison to that extent in Roman Catholicism because you also have God, and but you have, have the, all the saints. saints. Yes, yes. Uh, but the saints are not gods. I mean, but any Catholic some people, they that. do pray to the saints. They, they pray to the saint because they revere the saints in the mm -hmm. same way that Africans revere the spirits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they don't, uh, they don't regard but the spirits. But when you are Baptist, is a saint to, to, to pray to the Virgin Mary? No. Or to pray? no the Baptists, uh, Protestants no. usually don't. Uh, okay. But they pray directly to God. It's a notion that there is a mm -hmm. personal direct connection with God. Uh, okay. but, but in a sense, I mean, Jesus is one of the faces of God as well. So. Okay. <laughs> this so. is a very interesting uh, conversation. Of course, I, I still have a lot to learn, as you can see. Uh, we'll come back uh, um, next time to talk more about it. And I promise to, to do more research. <laughs> That's all right. That's okay. <laughs> it was a pleasure uh, being here with Dr. Mengles, Leslie. And uh, we have to do it again because I have much more to say about uh, African religions and my poems and uh, what I've accomplished and about my life. So, Well, thank you. And thank you for having me too. So, But okay. this has been wonderful and very enlightening. Yes. Thank you very much for telling us about yourself and about <laughs> your poems, which I enjoyed reading. Thank you.